Welcome, I'm Elizabeth Carr. I'm the first in vitro baby in the United States and I have the distinct pleasure of being joined today by Professor Alan Handyside, who along with Professor Lord Robert Winston at Hammersmith Hospital London, achieved the first pregnancies worldwide following IVF and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD of inherited disease back in 1990. And as well, I'm joined with Dr. Rafal Smagrowski, who's the physician and father of the first baby in history to be born conceived with the help of polygenic testing, and who happens to have her first birthday uh, this okay. week as well. So happy birthday to Thank you. Aria. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining me today. Um, I'd love to start off this conversation, you know, back in history. Uh, so obviously I was born back in 1981. Uh, IVF was brand new and still very controversial in the United States. Um, and, you know, not a lot of people knew about PGD. Um, and it was this kind of still unknown to the general public uh, concept. So Alan, I'd like to start with you and really talk about you know, back in 1989, 1990, you did the first PGD test for sex-linked disease by identifying the gender of embryos that were typically affecting only boys. Talk to me about how that all started and kind of the uh, brief evolution of where we are today. Yes, thank you. Well, actually, uh, my journey uh, began when you were four. <laughs> in the uh, mid-1980s. So at that time, I'd created a mouse model of a human disease called Lesch-Nyhan syndrome, which is one of these diseases that's caused by genetic defects um, uh, in genes located on the female X chromosome. And uh, in fact, it was the first time that it had been shown that you could, get, you could use embryonic stem cells so we derived embryonic stem cells and injected them into host blastocysts and generated this model in that way because we genetically manipulated the stem cells in culture. And that gave us a, a model then, uh, effectively. Um, so around the, the mid 80s, there were publications that were really stimulated by this very new at the time technique of the polymerase chain reaction that allow you to amplify DNA from very small numbers of cells. And the suggestion was made that actually you could test uh, pre-implantation embryos for the first time for mutations causing disease. And so I spent um, from 1985 uh, until I joined uh, um, Robert Winston in 1986, um, using the mouse model to show in principle that we could do this. And actually we used a biochemical assay because at that time we didn't even know a great deal about the mutations, the specific mutations. Um, uh, so uh, at that point I had to, I'd come to a fork in the road really. I'd been a, um, an embryologist and a stem cell biologist, uh, having isolated one of the first embryonic stem cell lines in the mouse. Um, but I realized that I had the skills, the manipulative skills that would be needed to sample uh, one or more cells from the human embryo. Um, and so I, I decided to join Robert Winston, who had the, one of the largest clinics in the UK um, and a very successful clinic in the context at the time. Although looking back, the pregnancy success rate was extremely low uh, <laughs> relative to today. And there are various reasons for that and we understand that a lot better. But um, So I made a, a very conscious decision to move and it was, uh, it was a risk. And so I moved to Hammersmith Hospital in London, uh, really with two aims. One was to achieve pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and the other was to isolate human embryonic stem cells. 
So I succeeded with the first, but not the second. So, so back in 1993, I'd love to be able to say that I predicted polygenic risk assessments. But what I did understand at the time was that um, the severity of disease could be affected by genes in the background. And I was very focused, mainly for the accuracy of testing, mm. to be able to go from amplifying a single sequence to two sequences. That was a big jump already. Right. <laughs> okay. So these are only 150 base pairs long, roughly, right? Just being able to amplify two of those from a single cell. And now, of course, we can amplify the whole genome right. and get lots of DNA. We can get as much DNA as we can get from Corian Hill sampling or animal sequences. And Rafal, you know, my last question for you before I let you all, both uh, converse with each other, I know you have questions for each other. My last question for you is, you know, you've been through uh, a pregnancy without this testing and now with this testing. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about how the process was different, obviously, um, and, and what it was like to kind of go through this, this whole process? Well, you know, for me, that was easy. I'm the father, right? So, of course, uh, the mother was bearing the brunt of the trouble, uh, you know, injections of, of hormones and everything. And, uh, you know, I, for me, it was, uh, it was an anticipation, a little bit of aggravation uh, when the first IVF provider refused to have uh, PGTP done uh, on our embryos. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, for me, there was a pretty uh, uneventful but hopeful process. Great. And I'd love to have you uh, ask each other questions now. I know, I know you're dying to ask some questions of each other, so please feel free.